You're listening to Sword and Pen. Hey everyone, this is Rich from the Sword and Pen podcast from Military Veterans and Journalism. Today, I'm sitting down with Dave Bruce, a retired Federal Air Marshal who also served in the 82nd Airborne as a paratrooper. Dave, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, so Dave, um, how long did you serve as Federal Air Marshal? Um, 19, 19 years. I worked for um, the legacy INS before that, which is now ICE. Awesome. And before that, you were in the 82nd. Um, what did you do while you were there? Correct. I was a uh, medic with a, a light infantry unit, with an airborne infantry unit. Cool. So how long did you serve in the Army? I was in the Army for four years. All right. And um, so as soon as you got out, you just knew that you wanted to go into law enforcement? It wasn't, you know, it wasn't that I knew that I wanted to go in law enforcement. Um, I think like a lot of people, you go into the military as a teenager, as a kid, and you come out at 22 years old or 23 years old, and you're a grown man. So, you know, my idea initially was to get out of the military, come home, live at my parents' house and go to college. Well, when I got back to the house and everything like that, I realized that that just probably wasn't really going to be a compatible situation. Uh, I was an adult. I'd been living on my own for so long. So I started looking at things that maybe had some crossover, careers that had crossover from the military. So I started looking at law enforcement and specifically, I started looking at federal law enforcement. I didn't really want to work locally. I wanted to do some things on probably an international level. I wanted to uh, capture some of that travel that I had done in the military as well. So I started plugging away and I think it took about six months and I got hired by the legacy INS deportation section. Cool. So what type of work did you do with INS? With INS at the time, um, this was, like I said, was right before they became what's known as ICE today. Um, I was in the deportation section. So we did some arrests. We did a lot of removals. Um, we did a lot of transports and with violent offenders, typically we escorted them back home. So if you look at a city like Boston, um, when people talk about ICE or INS or things like that, they think about people, uh, they think about agents arresting dishwashers and doing things like that. Boston, like most big metropolitan cities are dealing, the people that they're dealing with, with INS or ICE are probably 95% uh, criminal population of people that have served time in the local prison. So in the 90s in Boston, we had, you know, Jamaican posse, we had Russian organized crime. Um, we had a huge influx of uh, Brazilians. So basically we were making arrests or we were picking these guys up in prisons and uh, escorting them back home. Cool. So um, then you made the jump to federal air marshals. Yeah. And so um, right. Uh, I was I was with INS for six years and then 9-11 happened. And when 9-11 happens, the air marshal service opened up uh, right afterwards in the ashes of the Twin Towers. They realized that something had to be done, had to be done right away. So they were doing a mass hiring and they were hiring a lot of people with either military backgrounds, law enforcement or both. So I sat back and I looked at it and I was like, here's probably a chance to, at the time, uh, be at the tip of the spear with uh, taking this fight back. So yeah, I, I ended up uh, signing on with the air marshals in my background tactically and my background as a medic. They had tactical medic programs that were starting up and everything. It looked like a real good fit. So yeah, I went over right after 9-11. So like, what was, uh, what was your experience with uh, federal air marshals? I mean, what are, what are some highlights from that career? Well, um, I always said that if your family was on a flight over the Atlantic, you would absolutely want air marshals on that aircraft. Um, it's, it's something that is, that is absolutely needed. I did a lot of great traveling. Um, it was, I was only in probably two or three years and I went to the training staff. So I was a full-time trainer for six years over there. And then, um, 2012, a, uh, an opportunity came up to go to the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force. So I went to the uh, JTTF as an investigator, what's known as a task force officer. So the FBI has all different task force. One of them is the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and they bring in agents or detectives from other agencies and put them all under the FBI's umbrella. So you basically go do FBI work from that position in the counterterrorism realm. Cool. So, I mean, what type of what, what type of expertise were you able to bring to the table um, in, in that sense? 
Well, I had a lot of terrorism knowledge, um, studying, going to school, things like that. Um, I also brought in my immigration knowledge and also the travel overseas aspect of it. A lot of my uh, position required me being at an airport um, office where I worked. And um, just that international knowledge, flights coming in and out, threats from overseas, things like that. That's the uh, expertise that I brought in. But being there, I got to work with some of the best detectives and best agents that were around. So along the way, that's where you pick up your investigative skills, your interviewing skills, surveillance, um, running sources, things like that. Right. Which obviously has a ton of parallels to the world of journalism. So what what made you want to get involved in journalism at large or start writing? I mean, when did that happen for you? At what point? It's funny because that didn't happen for me until my early 40s. And it was right after the uh, the marathon bombing. Uh, I started doubling down on human source work. And I went out one day with one of the other agents and we did an interview. If you can picture the time, this was when ISIS was spreading overseas. And uh, we we're looking for as much information on that as we could possibly get. So uh, I went out with one of the agents that was there and we went and did an interview and we talked about how a country was completely changing, like Sharia courts were being set up, all this other stuff. So we do like an hour long interview and um, we get back to the office and he says, I'll write it up. Just do me a favor, take a look tomorrow. So I look in my email and I open up this document and I start reading it and it was incredible. It was great. It encapsulated everything that happened during the interview. And I thought to myself at that moment, I wouldn't have been able to put this together the way that this guy did. And this is a big piece of what we're doing over here. So I have to figure out, you know, a way to become a better writer, maybe a certificate course or something like that. So also right around that time, my ankle started acting up from a, uh, a parachute accident years ago. And uh, I'm going to the VA, having it checked out. And they said, yeah, you need surgery and everything. So they ended up bumping up my uh, disability status, which made me eligible for vocational rehab. So it reactivated essentially my GI Bill. And they said, we'll pay for any school that you can get to, any, any, uh, anything that you want to study. So right then I knew that I wanted to, I wanted to become a writer, maybe not necessarily journalism, but in, in the classical sense, like I don't think I ever wanted to really work for a newspaper or anything like that, but I wanted to write, I wanted to write books and magazines. So I went to uh, UMass Amherst had like the fifth best online uh, journalism program at the time. So I got signed up over there and started taking classes. That's a pretty interesting like foray into that world. Like, how one thing just leads to another, I guess you can never really tell what an experience is going to lead to, you know, like seeing another guy's report and being like, wow. And then now like the, tra the entire trajectory changes kind of where this alternate one appears. Yeah. And it was, it was honestly, when I first started doing it, it was more about becoming better at my current job on what I was doing. And then as I, I started going down the road and I started writing more and writing more, and then the next thing you know, like you become the resident writing expert in the office where everybody's bringing you resumes or forms or you're editing everybody's stuff and you're doing that. And then at night you're, you know, writing for, for college, you're writing these papers and um, yeah, just the, that immersion, I needed that immersion into writing. I needed to be able to say, Hey, I'm going to take like four or five years and write. Every day, you know, I'm going to write and I'm going to, you know, when I'm in school, I'm pitching uh, just like you would as a writer, you're pitching to an editor and your professor happens to be like a former editor for, from the Washington Post or Washington Times, one of the big papers. So they're being critical of you and, you know, drawing lines through your writing saying, what is this supposed to say? Isn't this redundant? Like I needed that period in my life for somebody to really be critical and say, you need to move this piece up here and get rid of this and, and say this in a different way. So, yeah, I, I believe in the process. I'm, I'm a believer in the process of writing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you I, I think it's hard to debate that, you know, I mean, you have to it's not like uh, <clears throat> maybe it isn't for some people, but I don't think it's the same as like a sport where it's like you know, some people could just pick up a basketball and they're like the best basketball player. I mean, like writing is, even if you are a great writer, I mean, you gotta, you gotta exercise the muscles. Um, and school is a great way of doing that too. I know a lot, you know, 
people have mixed opinions on it and not everybody's able to do it, you know, for various reasons. But if you do have the opportunity, especially, if, especially if you could like leverage folk rehab or uh, your GI bill, you know, whatnot, I mean, that's obviously a huge opportunity. Cause like you said, you get that feedback from an experienced editor who did that every day for, for work, you know, um, while you have the security of your job. So yeah, totally. that's, that, that's huge. I mean, now, what so like and i think you mentioned something about you know you didn't want to be a newspaper writer which you know you you just wanted to write for magazines or write a book but i, I think like journalism the umbrella of journalism has always been large but in recent history i think a lot of people you, you could apply journalism with a really wide lens um and so you don't really have to be that traditional newspaper writer anymore you can write for a magazine or you know plenty of journalists write books now um so i mean what while you were like exploring that, that uh, domain of journalism, like what skills did you find? Cause you were still working at the time. What, what did you say to yourself? Like, Oh, this is exactly like what I do on the job every day. Or, you know, like what, what kind of skills translated easily? Yeah. Um, there are so many skills that transfer over when you're looking at this, um, the ability to collect and verify information. You know, um, although we do it on a longer period of time, typically, I'm not trying to be first. And if I am trying to be first, I'm verifying everything that comes through. So there's no mistakes in, in collecting intelligence. So um, definitely going out and interviewing people and then collecting up that information and writing that up. But a, a big part of it is it's easy to it's very easy to um, collect information from a source and then report on it. What's difficult is establishing a relationship and finding a source. That's what I think uh, people, it's like a cold pitch, you know, when you're reaching out to a magazine, um, you have to have a good pitch. You have to figure out um, what motivates that magazine, just like you would look at a source and says, okay, what, what motivates this person that, that would make them want to talk to me, that would make them want to cooperate with me. Um, you have that carry over there, um, the documenting, when it comes to the, what, all of those skills transfer over, whether it's investigating, interviewing, source work, uh, social media um, exploitation, doing your uh, open source investigations and gathering that information. What's different is the government reporting is typically in structure, very dry, very factual. You're not really painting any pictures or anything, but so I would say, you know, the vast majority of those skills do transfer over, but you need to take some journalistic uh, writing classes or mentor under somebody that's an actual writer to pick up that kind of that writing flair if you're going to be selling this to a magazine or writing a book. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think definitely uh, have experience with dry government writing. It's like, uh, you know, uh, X, Y, Z happened at this place this time, you know, um, you know, real structured. And, and I think when I was in an, a cadet in RTC, my, my, um, my PMS, my commander, he said, uh, he, he was, he had a journalism degree and he was a really, really intelligent guy. And he said something to me like, you know, you suck at army writing. He's like, uh, he's like, you're a decent, you know, writer outside of that, but like, nobody cares about that. You have to be a good army writer. Can you write a memo? You know, could you write a memorandum for record? Uh, yeah. cause nobody wants to like, he would just, you know, run red lines through all my stuff, you know, like nobody wants to hear that. Like, it's like, keep it like this. So you, in within government work and, and the military, I think you really have to like have those two sides of your brain that you could tap into and say, okay, like in, put into context, who am I writing for? Um, what am I writing and, and how do I apply, you know, the, the two totally different worlds, you know, the skills from those worlds while I'm writing that. For sure. But, you know, and beyond even the skills that you pick up interviewing and things like that, if a, if a journalist sits down and they've never been to Syria and they've spoken to one Syrian in total, and now they're going to sit down and write an article on Syria, are they really in a position to be writing about Syria? So that's one of the things too working in the intel world is if you're on a project for four or five years, so you're covering ISIS or you're covering uh, Syria, you're talking to Shias, you're talking to Sunnis, people on different sides of the spectrum. You understand, you have a very good understanding of what's going on there. So if something happens today, you can write a very well-researched and uh, intelligent 
um, article on, on what you have. And I think, I don't think that that's something that people should step into lightly. I don't think that we should jump into uh, conflict writing. And then if we look at most of your newsrooms have, what is the, what is the percentage in the newsrooms for veterans? I think it's 2%. 2%. And then at times, if you look at what, you know, the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or whatever is writing on, you know, at times it probably comes up to 30% on conflict overseas. And that 2% of uh, journalists that they have writing there, some of those people are behind a camera, some of those people are support. So it's like, how many people have ever had boots on the ground in one of these places or actually dealt with the situation? And yeah. I think that that's what is needed in journalism. Yeah, few, few. And, you know, I think like <clears throat> the Times does it a lot, you know, but they, but you see these, like, I think you see these publications who lean super heavy on their guys, like, uh, like, all right. So the Times has Thomas Nibbins, Gibbons Neff. Uh, they have uh, John Ismay, you know, CJ Chivers, uh, those guys. Those are like, the, I think, in my opinion, or from what I've seen, those are their like three main guys who, you know, who run all, all those types of stories for them, but they, they do have other ones who are, who have been doing it for like 30 years or whatever, but you know, it, it's, it would be great to have more, you know, I think you could cover a, a wider area of, of conflict areas or conflict zones and have a, a, a more of a spread of experience too. Um, you know, so I, I think those guys have had boots on. I know they have had boots on yeah, the ground. It, those guys that you just mentioned are incredible. And if you look at their articles and their coverage, it is very well researched. Very, um, They're very experienced guys and their assets. I, I would just like to see more just like them. Right. Um, yeah. And and that's that that is, I think, what what people they ask, like, or I think the retort is a lot of times like, well, you know, you don't have to be a veteran to report on military topics. You don't have to be a former law enforcement. Like the argument I saw somebody says on Twitter the other day, you don't have to be a, a veteran to report on the military, just like you don't have to be a former cop to report on police, you know, but it, the caveat to that is like, or the response I think is like, yeah, but if you are, it's certain, you can certainly add a lot of valuable context because if you're a 22 year old who, or a 24 year old who just got your master's in journalism, or whatever, got this, this newspaper job, you know, and then like worked your way up in five, 10 years to cover these types of things. Like, yeah, I respect the fact that you covered it for a period of time and I'm not, you know, taking anything away from you because you didn't serve in the military law enforcement, but like, you gotta be humble enough to admit that like you were not on the inside and therefore there are certain things that you're just not going to be able to add context to. And, our, and, you know, and, and the other on the law enforcement side of that, it's like, how many of them are spending time sitting down talking to a police officer covering that end of the story on what they're dealing with? And then, you know, you have to ask yourself also, um, they're doing coverage on police shootings. How many of the people are a 24 year old journalism grad that's also a pacifist that doesn't believe that they would even defend their home if it was broken into? So, I mean, these are the things that we have to know before they're judging something that they have very little idea about. Right. Uh, you know, every, everyone became a use of force expert overnight on social media and yeah. uh, they can do this. They can't do that. You know, there's there's good shoots and they're bad shoots. But I think that I think that journalists should spend their time speaking with some people in the law enforcement community and seeing what their day to day life is like. Yeah, I think the problem one of the problems is that you're on tight deadlines. You know, your editors want things to be pushed, stories to be pushed out and stuff. And, you know you as a journalist, like there has to be some point where you're like, look, I, I need more time to make sure I get this right or whatever. I mean, you have to take a stand at some point and maybe you say, I don't have that time or whatever, but like, if you're going to put your name on something, you know, you should be, you should know beyond a shadow of a doubt that like you did everything to get that right. And sometimes like, I mean, Marty Scovin was talking about this. He's like, you know, uh, I forget what he was talking about the story, but he's, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, like we got that one journalism, got that one wrong or whatever, but I mean, like stuff happens, you know, I mean, it's to yeah. be expected occasionally, but you know, you should be able to come back and say, well, you know, we did everything we could at the time. This information wasn't available um, at that time. And that's, you know, so own up to it and stuff. But I think a lot of places have problems owning up to it. Um, you know, like, Oftentimes, I think you'll see like web stories redacted or, you know, a short editor's note, you know, but I mean, there'll, there'll be no like real like facing the facts of like, hey, you know what, we got this one wrong. And you're right. 
I don't think enough time is spent with the other side. I think it's, you know, we're in the midst of, uh, there were a ton of injustices, a ton of things that were, you know, over the past, like a lot of things have come to light over the past year or two, um, and things that need to change. But at the same time, like the point of journalism is to give every side, like a fair shake, you know what I mean? Like every side should be given an opportunity to speak. Um, and, and I think what's happening is, is like some certain sides, like the military law enforcement, um, a lot of those folks I think are like, just kind of pulling back because the opinion is like, look, my, my, my voice is not going to be heard anyway. So, you know, I'm not going to try to argue this. I'm just going to, I'm just going to pull back here and just do, put my head down and wait for, you know, wait for this to pass. Um, which I don't know, is that better or worse? <laughs> uh, you know, it, it, it still leads to the coverage not, or to the voice not being had except in like niche places. Yeah. And you know, that's why I like a lot of the veteran owned, uh, publications that are out there, uh, coffee or die black Rifle coffee, you know, they're great. There's a lot of publications out there that tell what they believe to be the full story. And, um, I think it's a little bit, I don't, I don't even want to say center. I don't want to say that, but what I want to say is, is, um, the people that are writing on this have experience in the things that they're writing on. And, and I think that that's important. And I, I think if we look at, if we look at all these different lines of work, whether, you know, whether we're talking about government or we're talking about journalism, people hire people that they think are like them. That's kind of how things go. Um, when they sit down in an interview, um, they're looking at what school this person went to. You know, they're looking at, did he go to one of the three schools that we typically hire from, the school that I went to? And, and I think that we're seeing that um, play out over and over again. So you have the same exact type of backgrounds with the people. And uh, just, you know, one or 2% being veterans there, there's a lot of preaching of diversity, but it's not really getting down to veterans from what I'm seeing. Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, my personal opinion is the time, the time for veterans was like, I don't know, like five, six years ago. Like, I, I feel like from 2010 on to like maybe 2014 ish. I mean, there was a huge push for, you know, veterans getting and, and then like now you see a lot of these um, these people who are vets who are in like very influential positions. I find a lot of them got in in between that time, like 2008 to like 2014 ish or so. And that was when that big push was that was the trend at that time. Right now, that's not necessarily the trend anymore. Like we're pushing towards other things, rightfully so in many cases, but at the same time, it's like, look, none of these things should be an afterthought, especially if you have a whole DNI, like, you know, wing set up, you know, you should, you should totally be focusing on this. I think some companies are, some places do better than others. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, we're talking about journalism and, and media, and I think that certainly needs to step it up, which is why MVJ exists in my mind, um, where it is, I mean, it's our mission, you know, to get more vets in newsrooms. Um, some of the things you mentioned, um, sitting down with a source, uh, not just like interviewing that source, but like truly establishing a relationship because what you get in the world of um, investigations and, and running sources and, and stuff like that is you get to read people. So like, you know, you could sit across from somebody and really get a good read on them and, and kind of be like, okay, you know what, I could, uh, I think I could, I could establish some rapport with this person on this level on this thing. And then like, to be able to like pick those things out and sort of like work your way into their, their trust. I mean, that could get you a really powerful quote that could get you some information you weren't going to have before, as opposed to, I mean, two people could talk two journalists could talk to the same person and get completely different information. So I think it's really yeah, that, valuable. That's how the Intel world, you know, works. Um, you're looking for a source. We always talk about placement, access, uh, willingness and suitability to do it. So you have people out interviewing one person and then somebody's out interviewing somebody else and then somebody's doing a deep dive social media and the other things. And then the puzzle gets put together with that, with all of the inf information corroborating the other things that are in there. And, and if it's not 100% corroborated, the information gets put out with caveats. You know that it's that this is not 100% vetted. This is a, a threat or this is whatever we're hearing right now. Right. Well, and, and corroboration is important, too, because something I see a ton in journalism is anonymous sources. Like, uh, you know, according to a source or according to, you know, somebody from here, it's like, 
you know, I don't know when I went to J school, what, what I was taught was like at all costs, well, the society of professional journalism, like in their, uh, like 10 commandments or whatever it is, their, their list of, um, values. I mean, it says like at all costs, you do not afford anonymity unless like it, it is truly required, you know, because that's what gives journalism that, that objective lens. But I, I just think that that's, you know, maybe this is, maybe this is sort of a rabbit hole, but I, I just think it's like, it's kind of, um, kind of gone in a lot of places, you know, like very respected institutions don't really follow that anymore um, on both sides of the fence. That's so. interesting that you say that because, you know, I just graduated from journalism school in 2019. And when we wrote, there was no such thing as a confidential source. wouldn't accept any of them. It had, cause they wanted to make sure that you went out and did the interviews because anybody could say they have a confidential source and write it, but right. they wanted to make sure that there was someone that could be contacted, uh, verified. Um, someone can always verify exactly what you wrote, you know? And I, and I do, I do think that's important as well. Yeah. Well, what happens, what, <laughs> so then is what happens after J school to newsroom? where, you know, now that becomes, you know, that becomes the norm. So there's obviously a breakdown somewhere, you know, I mean, this is like a bigger discussion, but yeah, I think, uh, anyways, to tie it back, something that, um, that Marty said was, which I thought was, was strong was, um, that vet veterans are skeptical, vet veterans are skeptics. Um, and that's what makes them partly like really good journalists. Um, which I think applies to the law enforcement lens too, is like, I, I feel like most people within those circles, like if you tell them something that sounds outrageous, they're going to, or, or sounds too good to be true. Like they're going to, they're going to immediately be like, mm, where'd you hear that from? You know, like where, where'd you get that from? And, and then like go and chase it down yourself. Um, yeah. Which I think is, is a huge part of journalism. I mean, that's what really makes a good journalist is that person who says like, no, I can show you every step of the way, like a science experiment, how I, you know, found this information and you could replicate that by using these steps too. Yeah. And that, you know, a, a veteran, anybody that served in the military is objective oriented. So they are getting out there and they're getting after it and they'll go to all ends to get what, to get done what needs to get done. They'll get up earlier. They're going to show up on time or extremely early. They'll stay later than most uh, most other people will. They're just they're just objective driven. That's what kind of we put people on a track like that when they're young people in the military, and then when they come out, that that never goes away uh, for most people that served in the military. They're go getters. They'll get after it and they'll get the story. Absolutely. So I think military veterans journalism obviously helps bridge that gap with the contacts that they have in media and things like that. You know, to somebody listening to this who's thinking that they're going to get out of a uh, similar field to you, uh, you know, veteran or, or military or, or law enforcement and go down this path. Like what could an organization like MVJ afford to them? I and mean, what have you gotten out of it? Um, I got a lot out of MVJ. First of all, Zach kind of served as another uh, writing mentor for me at times when I was writing to the magazines, um, I would send them to him and he would help me with the editing and everything. But uh, Dion Saucy from the New York Times was my mentor. And I think um, I spent six months pretty much in contact with her and she's still in contact today if I need her. Um, she explained to me the whole world of journalism and how to do all these things. You know, how do you pitch as an outsider? If you want to freelance, how do you get a staff job, how people get in the door? Um, and then the writing help was just incredible. Um, anyone that's kind of going down that road that decides that they want to be a writer um, needs somebody that's a writer to look at their stuff. Um, for instance, I'll give you a, another another mentor of mine was Robert Young Pelton, which I wrote an article at one point and I sent it to him and um, everything was there. He just needed to move the things. OK, your hook is up here. Your thesis is right here. This is your nut graph uh, down here, the second paragraph. And he just moved some things around. Um, I had him. And of course, through MPJ, I had Dion um, help me with things like that. The structure of my writing, which is what I needed a lot of help with. And um Another interesting thing is she was flying all over the place covering different things that were going on at the time. So I got to kind of talk to her how 
uh, during when those events were going on. And she was walking me through all the things that they were doing to collect information. And it really got my mind going on, on how to do things. And the network itself that someone like that can provide for you. She put me in contact with a lot of people that also helped me out down the line. Um, extremely valuable program to go through as MBJ. And you don't have to have your degree yet. You can, come, you can come into this while you're a student. You could come into this and do a certificate program. You could do your bachelor's degree. You could do whatever uh, you wanted to do, but they will put you with somebody that's gonna guide you along the way with this um, excellent organization. Yeah, and we and we're stepping up. We're, we're stepping up our mentorship program. We're gonna have um, a new website, um, a new interface, and uh, it's gonna be pretty cool. And you're gonna it's it's gonna be similar to like I don't know if you've used like Betterati, um, it, type of thing where you can kind of go uh, through like different profiles of mentors and see if you match up with them and stuff based on their background. So, you know, I think the mentorship program is hu hugely valuable um, and MVJ is growing and um, you know, it's, it's definitely like, like you said, if you're not, if you're not, if you don't have a degree in journalism or, you know, you're not a working journalist, like that's okay. Cause one of the memberships is aspiring journalist. I mean, uh, if you just think you want to go into this, like jump in, get a mentor, see if it's right for you and, and give it a fair shake, you know? Um, and so something else I'm interested in too is, is how, how do you balance writing? Like you, like you have been for a few years while you're still working, you know, I mean, what, what is that? You have your, your day job, which yeah, the skills are transferable, but like what you're doing every day is not the same as what you're doing in, in writing and journalism. So how do you kind of balance those two worlds and, and be good at both? Well, that's, that's kind of tough. You know, um, it depends which assignment I was on at the time when I was with the joint terrorism task force, that would be a difficult thing. And I stopped writing pretty much for a little bit while I was with them because you're using that creative energy throughout your day. Um, so I didn't do a whole lot of writing then, but as an air marshal, you know, locked in a tube over the Atlantic for six hours with an internet signal, um, in the middle of the night while everybody was sleeping, it, I found it to be probably one of the best times in the world to research and write. It's like, you've got six hours. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Talk about an awesome job too. <laughs> so it was so, it was so perfect. And, and I mean, even when I was going to, when I was going to school, I did a, um, I did four years and then I, I stepped out for a little bit and I went back to flying to finish the degree for a couple of years before I went back again. And when I was flying, like I said, it was just six hours in a tube and I would get on blackboard for school and, you know, comment, write my own stuff. And then I would take hours and, and, and write my papers and do all my research. That was a great thing. But what I'm getting at is if, if you wanted to have, if you wanted to be a writer as a sideline, if you said, Hey, I'm making really good money. Uh, doing whatever this is, but I, I'd like to do some writing. Uh, I really like to write, like to write for a magazine or a newspaper or something on the side. I think that you would have to almost take a job that wasn't a creative job where you were really using your mind for long periods of time and writing because nobody wants to write all day and then come home and write. Yeah. Um, so one of the, one of the guys that I follow, uh, Cole Schaefer, who's a copywriter, uh, he quit his job one day and he, he knew that he wanted to be a writer. So what he ended up doing was working for a company where he worked alone and he ripped up carpets all day and he saved up all of his creative energy. So when he got home at night, he would write for like five or six hours and uh, and just save it all up for that. So I think if you can get into a, a position where you can you're not using up all that creative energy at work. You can really do some great work on, on the off time and the writing ability, getting a journalism degree. Um, I think that they were some of the, the best agents that I worked with had backgrounds as writers or in journalism. And whether you're working in law enforcement or any government position, I, I think that the journalism degree has value. And if we're to compare it, you know, if we're to compare, you know, government work, versus um, journalism, I mean, unless you're working for one of the really big papers out there, I think that you're better off financially actually going into the government and you could do a lot of your writing right there. There's a lot of uh, public relations, public affairs positions, investigator positions. Um, 
one of the direct translations that I would see is um, counterterrorism analyst. Um, taking that journalism degree because you're going to bring in all of your research ability and all of your writing ability. And, and that's exactly what you do is putting together analysis. Um, and it's funny now being recently retired, I break down my work. I have the book writing and the magazine writing. But then on the other side of that, I work for a counterterrorism think tank. And then I also do some firearms training. So I spend most of my week either writing the book or writing the magazine. And then I spend about a day a week with the counterterrorism company and then a day a week with my firearm stuff. And it's like, it's a, it's a nice mix of, of uh, everything together. But a person with a journalism degree doesn't necessarily have to go down this this route. And, and if you're in a position where you're sitting there with a journalism degree, especially a veteran, if you're a veteran um, and you have a journalism degree, there's a lot of hiring programs that would bring you right into the government um, and so many different positions that somebody could work in. And you could be a creative, you could be an analyst at one of these organizations and, and do extremely well. And, and I think you're probably more likely to get hired right out of the gate by the government than you would be by a newspaper. Oh yeah, absolutely. That, I mean, that's, I think <clears throat> extremely reassuring like advice from somebody who's lived it. Um, I mean, you need good writers everywhere. Uh, you need people who can analyze a situation and think about it from like a journalist does in, in every single place and especially the government and in, with the government, it offers you that security and like, let's face it, everybody, you know, you and I both work for the government in different capacities. I mean, there, there's plenty of time where you can focus on things that you want to focus on or, you know, a specific assignment that you can get into where you're still doing your job. Um, but then also you get you have enough of that that brain power left um, to go ahead and, and write at the end of the night or, you know, work on some sort of creative project. I think that that at least the army for me when I was in the army was kind of one of the biggest drawbacks was I felt like it kind of took away from my creativity. Like it, it sort of stuffed it in a box. And I think, I mean, I was, an, I was an infantry guy, like you had to be creative in, in a lot of ways, but it was a totally different type. Um, and, but I think there are plenty of government jobs, like you mentioned, and like you've done where that creativity does ex still exist and you can still apply that in different ways and then pull back, apply it to different places. So um, extremely valuable advice, I think. Definitely. And and there's options that you could write under a pen name. Um, there's a lot of agencies that depending on where you went and work public relations or whatever, they'll let you write on, on your off time. You know what I mean? You could, you could still do that or you're creating narrative for that organization, which is in itself journalism, right. you're creating narrative and messages from that organization. Well, I mean, look, from a, from a government standpoint or, or really like any employer, if your employee is writing on their off time, um, and publishing under their name part of what they're talking about might be your organization if anything i mean that's a that's positive that's a net positive for you because you're like oh wow more people now know about this organization that this guy works at or this girl or whatever and and they're spreading the word positively so like that's good pr for us you know it's, it's people are going to look at us in a better light because they're going to be like wow you've got this person working for you you know and yeah i think that's important context to lend because some people look at the government and are like, wait, hold on, like federal law enforcement or, you know, something. I mean, PR has a tie back, but let's just use federal law enforcement for argument's sake. Like, what the hell does being a federal air marshal have to do with my journalism degree? Like, I want to write. And it's like, well, hang on. Like, you you also like have to look at life as a whole. Like, do you have a family? You know, do you have... How, how do you want to live? You know, do you want to wait to get a newspaper job? How much is that going to pay you? Is that what you want to do? You know, or, or do you want to kind of have uh, the best of both worlds in, in some ways? And, you know, I think there's a lot that people don't realize that they could experience because especially in that world, it's not like there's like, there's not all these people like telling you what's going on in it because a lot of it's classified or a lot of it's sensitive information and stuff. So there's just so much you don't know and, and you have to be open-minded too. Or, you know, I, I just, I got permission to write and then I pretty much left off what my experience was and I just went into this as a veteran that was in my bio that that's exactly who I was. I was a veteran with a journalism degree and I was writing about, or a firearms instructor and I was writing right. about things that um, that I was writing about. You leave it completely off of there, you know. Um, well, yeah, you get to choose what you pitch yourself as, <laughs> you know what I mean? 
Yeah, exactly. And especially if it's not, um, it doesn't have all that much bearing on the things that you're writing on. It's not going to hurt you in any way. I think I always talk about like a minimum level of credibility for a person. You need an, a minimal level of credibility and then you need the ability to communicate with people to get them to stop for one second and listen to you like a magazine um so when you send in your pitches you really have to you have to know the magazine that you're writing for and what their style is and everything like that and develop that good pitch but i started getting a lot of um a lot of responses and a lot of messages on linkedin to do um gear reviews and things like that so one of the ways that I did that was when I when I first started writing for magazines, I was writing for free. I was writing for um, Havoc Journal and a couple other places, a couple really good veteran publications. So what I did was I got published by them in my in my early times for free. And I started building up a little bit of a portfolio and I was using LinkedIn um, and I would drop that down in my LinkedIn. And then when I made my about section, I would just put um I'm a person that writes um, engaging pieces about interesting people, you know, terrorists, smugglers, business owners, uh, whatever the case, interesting people, adventurers. Right. Um, and if you would benefit from uh, an article or a piece, feel free to reach out to me. Right. So then instead of me chasing it out, it would come to me and they would look at that. And there was already that little bit of credibility up there. It's like, oh, this guy's already been published four or five times. They read your article, they see the tone of it and figure out if they like you or not. But you have to, I think for, for most people that are looking into writing, you just need to start writing. You just need to get, there's so many avenues that you could get involved with a blog or something like that and provide free content initially for a little bit. And then, uh, and then there comes a point where you sit back and you say, I'm not doing this for free anymore because I'm right. getting published by, by paid companies. But People, no one's going to come in, and that's one thing that veterans really understand is no one's coming to hand you anything, you know, <laughs> no, no one's yeah. handing you anything. If, if anything, we got, we might have to try to slide through the side door here. You know, you have the front door of the club where the, uh, where the rich people are getting in and the connected people are getting in the back. Veterans use the side door. They find a different way to, uh, to sneak into the club so we can get in. And, and that's what we always do. And we do that by doing massive amounts of work and, and showing our work right there and then putting that out for the world and, uh, and continually pitching on that level. Yeah. I like that. That's a really good analogy. And I think it's, it's very true. Cause yeah, oftentimes we're not coming out with those connections, you know, but we do have that really important. We understand that important fact that nobody's here to, to give you anything like you, you get to work, you know? And yeah. And I think that's a lot of people spend so much time thinking like, Oh, what's the perfect piece to write? Or, you know, what's it? I want to, I only want to write for the New York times. And it's like, listen, man, like just get your name out there. Like you said, establish that credibility so that people can say, okay, look, I could, if I, they might not even read it, but they're like, Oh, he has four or five articles. Okay. Yeah. I'll, okay, I'll listen to what this guy has to say, you know? And meanwhile, they don't even know what they say. They don't know if you got paid for him or not. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, it's like, if you're not willing to write for free for some period of time, then are you really a writer? I mean, are you, do you, exactly. do you really, do you really want to do it or do you just want to talk about it? So you, you, know, you hit on it just right there is, well, first of all, perfect is, is the enemy of good, right? So it's like, when we're sitting there waiting for this piece to be absolutely perfect, we're wasting time, you know, kick something off, get it going. Right. Um, but do you really want to write? Is this what you really want to do? And you should speak to people that are in that kind of world. And I feel the same way about law enforcement or working for the government. If you're considering working for a government organization, you should really make contact with a handful of people or as many people as you can from that organization and kind of gauge what the happiness level is at that organization. There's a lot of different careers, just like the military. There's a lot of different um, careers. Maybe the guys that are in this section aren't happy, but the guys over here are living the life. And that's right. kind of what we have to figure out. And right. as writers, we can kind of build that world ourselves. We're not waiting to be accepted into an organization. We just start spitting out content. And if you don't have anything that you think is super interesting to write about and, um, and you want to write a piece, find a very interesting person and reach out to them you know early on my kind of game was when I first started writing these articles is I was reaching out to people that were writers themselves and had books uh, uh, that were coming out and it was kind of like a twofold thing and I would reach out and say hey I'm a veteran I'm a writer I I'd love to interview you and sit down and do a piece so 
they're getting some free publicity. Right. And they're also giving you, they're used to interviewing people. So when you're interviewing these people that have written these excellent books out there, they know exactly how to break everything down to you. They're the easiest write-ups that you'll ever do in your life because they paint the full picture for you. Right. Yeah. And and I think that's <clears throat> something that you, that you t- get from your type of world that you come from is like, that, that doesn't come as second nature to everybody to think of it like that, to like you looking at it strategically and you're like, hmm, this person's basically going to write this for me uh, when I do this. And it's, and they get something like, what do they get out of it? You know, what's their buy into this? So that's really important to look at it like that. And, and uh, I think that this world of writing has a lot to do, like you said, a lot of parallels between military and law enforcement in terms of like, do you really want to do it? Have, you know, because like you you did mention in writing, like you don't need anybody to let you in. Like you could do it yourself. You know, that that's a beautiful part about it. Like you can just start writing, but at the same time, if you're not fully committed to it, you're going to fail just like the military, just like law enforcement. And there was plenty of people like that, that I'm sure you've come across. I know I have. And it's like, look, I'm not going to look at you any differently. If, if you tap out because you don't want to do this, I will look at you differently. If you keep trying to fake the funk and then, you know, mess up down the line or mess other people up because you're not fully committed. Uh, but this is not a world that you could be like, half committed to, you know, you don't have to do it full time, but when you do do it, you know, you have to be about it and yeah. not just talk about it. And, and I think that applies to all those worlds. Yeah. It's, so. an, it's an art. You know what I mean? It's, it's really an art and you have to look at it that way. And after, you know, when, when you write a paragraph, your first sentence has to make the person want to write, ha- want to read the second sentence. We are constantly competing for people's attention. So when you get done writing something, you got to look at it and say, wow, that's kind of cool, you know? And then, you know, you show it to other people and you watch their expression and gather from it and see if they like it or don't like it and uh, figure out what your audience is and, and bounce some of your, uh, your pieces off of them. But the, the carryovers from investigative work have been unbelievable. So like to find an editor for a magazine isn't always the easiest thing to do. So I would get on like Instagram, LinkedIn, all of these things, find who's putting out the content. And then if I could see what the person's name was, um, like Skillset Magazine to find their information, I find out the, the person's first and last name. And then I go into, um, what's it? it's called Hunter IO. It's an email search app. And I type his name in and there's an at, and then I type up Skillset Magazine and it spits me the editor's, you know, information. And that, that's a really important thing when you're pitching. Yeah. You might have the greatest idea in the world. You might be pitching it to the wrong editor of the magazine. If you're pitching a lifestyle uh, article to the sports guy, right. he's just going to throw that out. He's not going to recirculate this thing. So locating the right person is also a big part of this. And, and the military does that as well, as you know. Right. Or the general pitch inbox, you know, just get lost in that haystack. Um, so let me ask this, like, what are you, what are you up to now? Um, so you mentioned before we got on about some things you're working on, what can you talk about and, um, tell us about Yeah, I'm pretty much wide open on that. So like I said, um, I, w- a month ago, my whole idea was to rent this office in Salem, um, come here and write, uh, magazine articles for a couple of different magazines and I crunched the numbers and everything like this and I said there's a lot of money doing this I can write four days a week and and make pretty good money doing it and my idea was that I was going to write a book probably two to three years down the line from where we are right here I figure I'll keep going I'll keep getting experience and everything so a guy reached out to me on LinkedIn who was a former police officer and he was a task force officer assigned to the ATF. So right there, I was a task force officer, the JTTF, he was with the ATF. So he reaches out and says, I'd really love to tell you my story. And he starts to go into it. And on a, uh, he was arresting a drug runner a few years back and he got shot six times and actually died on the scene and they brought him back. So he starts explaining this piece to me. And I kind of push back away from the desk. I'm like, this is way bigger than me. There's no way that I'm going to tackle this. But one of my really good friends, uh, Mark Sapula, is a local writer. And he's also helped mentor some of my writing along the way. I said, let me introduce you to a good friend of mine who's a local crime writer. This is what he does. He has several um, 
He has several books that are published already. The Last Longshoreman, Miami Underground, a couple others. Um, this is right in his wheelhouse to do it. So we all sat down with drinks and a cigar and started talking about it. So he starts telling his law enforcement career all the way up to the shooting, everything that goes bad after the shooting. And then there's kind of this climb out of this where now he's dedicated his life to helping law enforcement officers that are violently injured in the line of duty. Um, which there's a ton of them, but that's very rarely publicized. But um, his story is that classic, you know, struggle. So he's telling his story to Mark Sapula and I'm listening and um, Mark looks at me and says, I really need you to write half of this. He says, all of the investigative stuff, I need you to write the shooting. He says, I'll start the book off, you write that. And then I'll climb back out from the hospital all the way to his recovery and what he does now. So. A good portion of my day now is uh, invested in either interviewing him and other people that were involved in the incident and uh, writing the story. That's awesome, man. That that's, I think that's huge. I think it's going to be huge for you and to get your name attached to a book. Like I, I, we were speaking about before was, you know, not waiting until that perfect time, which we've spoken about a few times now, not waiting until like everything is perfect, but just like, you know, when opportunity comes knocking, like you gotta be ready to jump. Um, and you may not be perfectly ready or, or whatever you want to imagine, but like, it, you know, you got the bones, you know, you got the, the infrastructure there, jump in, catch up and, and get in the game. You know, um, I think that's what you're doing now. I think that's great. Um, yeah. So let's, let's finish up here. What, what, uh, what do you have to say to anybody, you know, any last words of wisdom you want to leave to um, people coming out of the law enforcement community or, or veteran community that are thinking about doing kind of what you're doing and, and haven't made the jump yet? Yeah, I, I really think that you could make a great life for yourself to do that. I'm retiring at the age of 48 and going, you know, full time as a writer. And I'm not really worried about bills or anything like that. And that, that's the thing is like your mind is at ease. You can write and chase this art for the rest of your life and you can get out at a relatively young age where there's still enough meat on the bone that you can go on to something else. I, um, I definitely think that a journalism degree is an, is an excellent idea, especially for creatives. And I think it's a really good entryway into intelligence and into law enforcement and then eventually writing or, or directly into writing. Um, we talked about it a couple of times, like, opportunities um just like the book they don't really come on your schedule they come when the opportunity is ready but in the meantime if we put the work in if we keep working keep reaching out to people keep pitching our ideas and stuff all of this stuff will come together and, and you'll be able to figure it out it's a um mvj is a great program and if you have your journalism degree or don't have your journalism degree and think you want to go down this route, they're going to add that structure that you need. You have people that are accomplished journalists uh, on speed dial that you can call anytime and bounce ideas from. And we all should have mentors in our life. And on the other end of that, we should also be mentoring people. We should be showing people the way to success. You know, it's like the military. Uh, they, when I was a medic in the military, they used to always say, learn one, do one, teach one. Like if you did stitches or an IV or something like that, you learn one, you do one on your own, and you teach one. And we should keep applying that military system throughout our life. And there's nothing, you know, more noble than helping our fellow veterans get to where they need to be. Absolutely. I really like that. Learn one, do one teach one wrote that down all right dave bruce thanks for your time today thanks for joining us and i appreciate it take care man thank you very much i appreciate it